Good afternoon. My name is Honor Feedy, and I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar on Preventing Bullying Part 1, Specific Strategies. Um, as part of our presentation, we, uh, you can download a copy of the PowerPoint presentation um, off of our website at www.naesp.org backslash webinars. Also, I'm recording this session, so if you'd like to download um, it after we're done, uh, it should be ready by next week. So uh, with that, um, the, on your panel that you have, um, I would invite you to utilize the chat box to write in your questions as we have them. Um, I will for relay them to our speakers and they can answer them um, throughout the presentation. We have a lot to cover this afternoon. Um, this uh, webinar is the start, uh, first part of a two-part series that we have on bullying. Uh, NASP is a huge concern in that area, and we wanted to provide you resources uh, and information on that. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, our speakers, um, Dr. Lindsay O'Brennan and Dr. Katherine Bradshaw. Um, they are with the Johns Hopkins Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence. Um, I'd like to take a moment before I turn it over to them to give you a little information about them. They're uh, real experts in, in this area. Dr. Lindsay O'Brennan is a postdoctorate fellow at Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. She received her combined doctorate degree from the University of California, Santa Barbara in counseling, clinical, and school psychology. She specializes in implementing school-based interventions aimed at reducing youth violence and in improving the climate of the school for students and staff. As part of Dr. O'Brennan's involvement in the Johns Hopkins CDC-funded Center for Prevention of Youth Violence, she has been training and coaching schools in positive behavioral interventions and supports, PBIS, and the Olwilis Bullying Prevention Program, which I'm sure she'll give you more information on. Uh, currently, she is working with the Baltimore City Elementary and Middle Schools to build capacity for the implementation of these evidence-based programs. Um, with her is Dr. Katherine Bradshaw, Professor and Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development at the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. She is also the Deputy Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for the Prevention of Youth Violence and Co-Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Prevention and Early Intervention. She holds a doctorate degree in developmental psychology from Cornell University and a master's degree in education and counseling and guidance from the University of Georgia. Her primary research interests focus on the development of aggressive behavior and school-based prevention. She collaborates on research projects examining bullying and school climate and the implementation of evidence-based prevention programs in schools. So as you can see, both presenters have a wonderful wealth of information. We are so pleased to have them. Uh, with that, I will turn it over um, to Dr. Bradshaw. Well, thank you so much, Honor, for inviting us here to present some of our work and experiences around the issue of bullying and more broadly about school-based prevention and climate promotion. Lindsay and I have been working together for about seven or eight years now on a variety of projects, and we're excited to share some of our lessons learned with you all during our session today. And I would really like to uh, give you a quick overview of the, the, the purpose of our session today and uh, what our goals of, of this particular event are. And uh, we really wanted to start off by talking a little bit about what bullying is, what it looks like in schools, how does it impact the climate and, and children's behavioral and mental health. And then we're going to segue into conversations about effective strategies for intervening and preventing bullying, with a particular focus on what to do there in the spot when you actually see bullying happening. And when you're going back to your schools and working with your staff around professional development, what are some activities that you can engage in to increase their likelihood of intervening. And then Lindsay's going to give us a bit of a perspective from the school and highlight a couple of the lessons learned that she has working more recently in some schools in Maryland and more broadly in her experience in California as well. So with that, it's often helpful to start off with a definition of bullying. And many of us walk around thinking we know what bullying is or have an idea of what bullying really is. But only just in the past few weeks, the US Department of Education came together with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and put forth this very specific definition of bullying. And I want to highlight a couple of elements of it. 
Um, and while these federal agencies are not really intending this to be a policy statement, it is helpful to get an idea of what the federal government views bullying is. And I also want to draw your attention to a couple of things that they've pulled out of this particular definition. For example, they didn't want us to consider issues around sibling, bullying, or even relationships around dating partners, which sometimes can get a little bit confusing when we're talking about bullying, especially bullying that might occur outside the school environment. But bullying is generally unwanted aggressive behavior that happens on the part of one youth or even possibly a group of youth where there's this difference in power, or perceived power difference. And it often tends to be repeated over time, or looks like it might be repeated over the time. Bullying can actually cause very serious effects in terms of children's behavioral and mental health concerns. And I'll go into that in greater detail. If you want to see a little bit more about this definition of bullying and some other things to look for, you can go to the stopbullying.gov website that's listed at the bottom here. I want to hone in on three core issues that distinguish bullying from other types of problem behaviors that you might see in schools. For the first piece is that this behavior is intentional and is aggressive in nature. So that's different than kids just kind of playing and picking on each other and being friends and uh, crossing a line on occasion. But it's that intentional type of behavior that is more intense in nature. There's also the aspect that's repeated. And sometimes I get administrators that say, well, should I wait till it happens a second time before I intervene or do anything about it? Should I not document it this first time because we don't really know if it's bullying? And my answer is always no. You want to take any kind of act very seriously. But when you're trying to tell the difference between an act that might be bullying versus a fight or other kind of disagreement between students, you can get an overall feel for whether it looks like this pattern might be repeated over time or have a tendency to do so. And the third is this power balance power imbalance that occurs. And that could be due to students' age or physical strength or even their competence. So for example, some children that have developmental disabilities don't really have the forethought or the insight to communicate with others quite as well. And that can actually be a power imbalance. They could be of lower status within the school because they're hindered by this. And I've underlined the I and the R and the P because I always like acronyms. And if you kind of read across that RIP, it's in a little bit different order. But that can help you remember that R for repeated, I for intentional, and P for power and balance. And as we start to think more broadly about this issue of bullying, quite often our initial thought is, well, we just focus on the target of, or the kid that's being victimized in this scenario, and also thinking just about the kid who's perpetrating this. But we also know that there are a number of other youth that serve as bystanders, other kids that are witnesses to bullying, and might actually play a role in it, either helping out the bully to do bad stuff, or actually helping out the victim to stand up for themselves or get help from adults. This is a graphic from that was developed by a guy named Dan Olveas. You hear us use that name quite a bit. He's uh, one of the, the godfathers of research around the area of bullying. He's from Norway, and hence his name, Olveas. It's a little interesting pronunciation there. And he's developed a program called the Olveas Bullying Prevention Program. And Lindsay's going to walk us through a little bit later on some examples of activities that are included in that program. And it's one on a list of evidence-based approaches around bullying. But I wanted to pull out a couple of themes from that, really, to highlight this dynamic that occurs in bullying situations. In the middle of this graphic here, you see a kid that it might be the target of bullying, the one who's been exposed, and that's labeled H. But up on the top left, you see the A, and that's the kid who started the bullying. But there are a number of kids toward that left-hand side that might be followers or supporters or even passive supporters by not standing up or saying anything to an adult or even to the the perpetrator of the bullying, that their behavior is wrong. And what we really want to do is start to shift that dynamic in the school where we swing the power around to be the kids that are on the right-hand side of this diagram, the ones that are potential defenders of the bullied child, or ones that actually reach out for help and engage adults for support. So this graphic is really just to illustrate the complex nature of bullying. And it's not just the kid that's being targeted or the child that's perpetrating the bullying, but this broader set of youth that might be involved in it. When we think about some of the data on bullying, we know that roughly 30 to 40 percent of students are involved in bullying. There's some interesting developmental trends that we see bullying starts to really uptick in elementary school 
and some research indicates it might peak toward middle school and then either decline slightly or stabilize in high school. It varies a little bit by the form of bullying, and we'll talk about different forms in just a moment. But keep in mind that the rates could vary a little bit across schools as well as across different developmental levels. But when we look at the research and we break down different types of involvement kids can have in bullying, we see that about 23% of kids are involved largely as the target or as a victim of bullying. About 8% are largely just as the perpetrator of bullying. And then there's this interesting group that has the experience as both the target as well as the perpetrator. And that's just about 9%, what we often refer to as the bully victims. And I'll tell you in just a few minutes, but I'll give you a quick snapshot of this. We actually find that those kids with that bully victim profile that are involved in both roles have the greatest risk for behavioral as well as mental health problems as a result of their bullying experiences. When it comes to gender, we do see that boys are generally more likely to report being involved in bullying, but that varies a little bit based on the form. You might be familiar with what we often refer to as social forms of bullying or relational forms, where kids are trying to manipulate their social standing within a group through things such as gossiping or rumor spreading. Those are, in fact, a bit more common among girls and actually are perceived as more harmful for girls than they are for boys. In contrast, boys tend to be more upset and harmed by the physical forms of bullying as compared to girls. When we look at racial or ethnic differences, what's also important for us to keep in mind is kids may not use that term bullying. We see in Baltimore City, for example, kids aren't really calling it bullying. They might call it being banked. And really, we have to make sure that we're using the language that the students are. Even though we have policies that are very specific about bullying and use complex definitions like the one I showed you just a few minutes ago, we have to keep in mind that there are cultural and contextual factors when we communicate with students as well as parents about this. But generally, we see that African American students are more likely to be involved in bullying as both a target as well as that bully victim subtype. When we think a little bit more about different forms of bullying that kids can be involved in, we can break it into two broad groups. The first are the more direct forms, hitting, teasing, name calling. And then there are the indirect forms. And these are often the ones that are hardest for adults to really pick up on. They include rumor spreading, exclusion, cyberbullying. And in fact, uh, when we see as kids get a little bit older, they're less likely to use the direct forms of bullying those tend to be a little less common as kids age into uh, the upper elementary school grades and middle school grades, whereas the indirect forms really catch on quite a bit more. And I know many of you are working with younger children or perhaps communicating with parents, even of preschool age children, pre-K setting, kindergarten setting. And sometimes teachers as well as parents get a little confused about the difference between rough and tumble play and fighting. And where does that end and where does bullying begin? We actually did a project with Sesame Street Workshop where they put together a really nice set of materials that feature Big Bird and an episode of Sesame Street where Big Bird actually gets bullied. And we spent a lot of time talking with the folks at Sesame Street about how to develop a really nice video around that. So for those of you that are working with younger populations or start to see this being a little bit of a concern in your younger elementary school grades, that's certainly an option to recommend some of those resources. And it helps parents tell the difference between rough and tumble play and fighting. Cyberbullying is one form of bullying that we're actually seeing might actually be on the increase, whereas some of the national data suggests that other forms of bullying are pretty stable, if not starting to decline a little bit. Cyberbullying is actually a little bit on the increase. What's important to keep in mind is aspects of cyberbullying, the fact that kids have access to cyber communication 24 hours a day means that they're able to inflict harm on each other, especially in areas where there's not a lot of adult supervision. And when we think about different common forms of cybering, cyberbullying, this includes emailing, instant messaging, chat rooms, Twitter, all kinds of different places where kids can actually inflict harm among each other. On the right-hand side of the graphic here, you can see a list of different types of examples that kids engage in. Sometimes it actually can lead reach to a legal level of harassment or stalking type of behavior, especially when it can include graphic visual images or even ones that are of a sexual nature. So that's important to keep in mind is the distinction between bullying and what might actually constitute harassment. 
and that often comes up quite a bit in the in the cyberbullying area. So it's often what we hear from students is that they're kind of outed, they're uh, disclosing a secret. It might be around their sexual orientation or their sexual activity or how they spend their time or what they do with their friends or even tricking kids to disclosing some personal information or starting a fight online, as you can see here, labeled flaming. These are all different types of problems related to cyberbullying that make it a little bit different than other types of traditional forms of bullying. So I was mentioning it can happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even when kids are at home and they're safe of their class in, of their home and if they're working with their parents it can happen right under their eyes it can also be done anonymously which is a little bit different from other forms of face-to-face -face bullying but in fact the research shows that most kids that are involved in cyberbullying actually think they know who perpetrated the initial act so that's really something to keep in mind is we can't assume that just because it was a cyberbullying act that there's no way to trace down the kids that started it. There can also be long-lasting effects of cyberbullying, and that can impact um, their behavioral and mental health problems. In fact, some research shows that when a text comes in, that that's not quite as hurtful as a, video, a visual image, like a video or even a, a graphic photo. Those images kind of get burned in kids' heads, and they remember them, and they're really hard to actually take down and totally destroy. So that's one reason why cyberbullying can actually be a bit more harmful and hurtful for kids than other forms of bullying. But what's also critical that we remember is cyberbullying is one of the least common forms of bullying that kids experience. The more common forms are those relational forms where kids are spreading rumors and social exclusion, as well as the physical threats and verbal threats that we often hear. When we think about some of the research on bullying and what impact it can have on students, we see a broad range. It can include impacting their self-esteem, even bringing on symptoms of anxiety and depression that can lead some kids to withdraw from school, skipping school and avoidance of running into those peers also can lead to loss of interest in school and in turn translate into poor grades on their report card and on standardized tests. When we think about illness, there's actually been a series of very interesting studies that have drawn upon data from nurses and other sources to be able to document that kids that are involved in bullying are actually feeling physical symptoms as well as the more psychological ones. This is particularly common among our younger kids, like those in elementary school that you all are working with. They experience headaches, sleep problems, stomach aches. Some of these are what we would consider psychosomatic pain. There's not really a biological source of it. It's more psychological in nature. But these feelings of anxiety and tension can actually lead to kids having the stomach aches and sleep problems, and generally disen feeling disengaged and unhappy and even signs of depression. When we think about involvement in bullying, we want to consider also the kids that are perpetrating the acts of bullying because those kids are more likely to get into fights, might actually get injured in a fight as a result of it. They're also more likely to engage in other delinquent types of acts, like stealing property, vandalizing things, using drugs like alcohol or smoking. We tend to think of this as a little bit of like a trajectory or a timeline where you start to see these problem behaviors occurring early in kids' development, and then they just continue across the life course if they're not intervened with effectively. And that can certainly translate into poor academic performance or even really serious threats to the school's safety, such as weapon carrying. In fact, there was a longitudinal study that was recently conducted where they had data following kids, I believe, starting as early as age 9 and up to age 24. And they found that those kids that were perpetrating bullying they were four times as likely to have a legal convention, uh, conviction by the time they were age 24. So this is all really telling you we can't di dismiss this type of behavior as just being common among kids and something that they'll get over. We really need to be thinking about how we have systematic interventions for kids involved in bullying, both as a perpetrator as well as the target. When we think about the broader set of social and emotional problems affecting youth, we see that that subgroup of the youth involved as both bullies as well as targets are more likely to endorse retaliatory attitudes. That means they think it's OK to hit back when they're hit, and that can really lead to a pretty serious cycle of violence. 
also can lead to internalizing problems like depression and sadness and feeling disconnected from the school environment and just unsafe. Kids that perpetrate bullying, they also feel that they're a little more popular and they're somewhat enhanced by their role within the school and that their behavior is justified or okay. That this is a, what we call instrumental harm, that they're doing this to meet some kind of goal. Sometimes the goal is really just about putting others down to make themselves feel better or feel more connected or more powerful within the schools. The effects of bullying similarly just don't go away over time. Some kids are able to cope with these experiences and really reach out for support from adults or get help within the school setting. And some just have a lot of interpersonal strength that they're able to be more resilient in the face of these experiences. But I'm often shocked when I give presentations to adults and I even hear some people, even into their 70s and 80s, will say, oh my gosh, I remember this experience of bullying that I had when I was a kid. And unlike other experiences that they had growing up, they can remember great detail about those events, what they were wearing, even sometimes what the day was or who all was involved, very detailed memories of these types of events that suggest there was something very salient about that. And that shows up in the literature as well, that we're able to see long-term impacts of bullying. And why should we address the issue of bullying in schools? We really want kids to feel safe and feel connected to the school environment because it's a real investment in their future. It also pertains to the overall climate of the school. Climate is such a buzzword that we hear a lot about now in education, about how can we improve the way that kids feel a sense of trust and connection to others in the school. And we know from a long line of research that kids that are involved in bullying even as the perpetrator, feel less safe in that environment, feel less connected to others. We really want to promote a positive environment where kids feel comfortable intervening on behalf of each other and reading, reaching out to others. And occasionally there are instances of bullying that do culminate in serious acts of violence within a school setting. This is punctuated by some acts of violence that we've seen in school shootings over the past decade or so. So issues around crisis or risk management is important for us to keep in mind. It's also a wise investment because if we can cut down on rates of kids' problem behavior, we know that that can translate into improved academic engagement. And frankly, it's also the law in all states right now, except for uh, Montana is really the last state to come on board as it relates to passing laws specifically related to bullying. The issue of harassment has been in the books for years. But more recently, have states really signed on for detailed policies and procedures and laws related to bullying prevention. So I'd encourage you to reach out to your State Department of Education to learn more about the bullying laws in your area. You can also access information about it on the StopBullying.gov website. They have a state map where you can click on all the states and learn more about what policies and procedures are related to bullying in your state. When it comes to preventing bullying, we want to make sure we're supervising students well. And this is critical to all aspects of classroom management and student engagement, is that we have active supervision. We also want to make sure that all staff have training about what to do and the on-the-spot training and experiences that they can have as part of their professional development that will help them learn what to do and what not to do when they actually see bullying. We'll talk more specifically about some of those in just a few minutes. Holding meetings and talking with students about bullying, both before it happens as well as after it happens, is critical for getting student engagement around this issue. And developing plans that are important for giving multiple parties, like parents as well as the school support staff, the counselors, school psychologists, information about how they can support students that are involved in bullying on either side. So now drilling down a little bit more about on-the-spot interventions. What should teachers do when they see it? Well, the critical element, the first step, is always intervening and stopping the bullying. We want to make sure that they label the behavior as bullying, draw the attention and not just break up the disagreement that happens and send kids back to their classroom, but really the label the behavior that they're seeing or that they're concerned about as bullying. Want to make sure that they break up the group. Because you know, just like when there's a fight or something in the school, you don't want to just separate the two kids for a minute, but you really want to dismantle that group immediately. And you're going to intervene with both parties. Really, we recommend that you acknowledge the impact that this has had on the target, but follow up um, 
a little bit later on with the kid that has been involved in bullying as a target. So that way you can hear more about their perspective. Because you don't want to get into that when you're in front of the other kids. In fact, they can be embarrassed and less likely to disclose details of the event or how they felt if other kids are around, even if they're possible friends. So you really want to break the group apart and do your investigation with youth individually. Also talk to the kids that were witnesses to this, those bystanders. Not only can they provide important information about how to intervene and stop bullying in the future, but they too might actually be impacted. Remember that cycle I was talking about before from the OVAS model, where there are kids that are potential bystanders or might even be interveners. Sometimes those kids feel really guilty, like they should have helped out but they didn't, or perhaps even concerned that they might be the target of bullying next. So that's why it's so critical that we talk about with the bystanders as well as the kids that are directly involved in the bullying. You want to make sure you have immediate and appropriate consequences. And consequences doesn't necessarily mean punishment. And so we want to make sure that there are consequences for the behavior. Because in many cases, this is a behavioral problem and a problem where kids are distrusting and abusing each other. So we want to make sure that there are appropriate consequences and the kids that are perpetrating bullying know that it's wrong and that there'll be consequences as a result. Want to make sure that that kid that was involved in bullying as the target is protected from future bullying. And sometimes that might require um, a longer term separation between the bully as well as the target in these situations. We've also done a fair amount of research to understand what kind of goes wrong in this scenario. What happens when teachers try to intervene and aren't very successful with it? Or worse yet, when we hear from students that they see a lot of bullying, but that they don't feel like the adults are doing enough to support them and help out. Lindsay and I have been particularly interested in this because we think it's an important teachable moment for adults, learning more about how adults can recognize bullying. In fact, when we ask staff about this, most of them think that they have pretty good strategies. Most think that they can handle bullying situation or that they'll report it and intervene effectively. But when we ask students, we get a very different perspective on this. And we think part of that is the adults don't really recognize the behavior or know how important it is or its potential impact on students. And there's also some issue about uncertainty related to intervening on particular groups. So what to do with youth that might be gay, lesbian, transgendered, or gender atypical. Those are particular situations that our research indicates staff feel especially uncomfortable. They don't know what to say. They feel it might be a taboo or uncomfortable topic in their school. And so sometimes they ignore those situations just as a way of avoidance. Similarly, youth that might be overweight or have other issues, um, sometimes racial or ethnic minority students, and that the staff are thinking they're kind of walking the safe road here by not mentioning things or not addressing it directly. But that's why we really need to provide a lot of training and professional development and support for teachers about doing this. And ultimately, a lot of it comes down to time. We need to make sure that adults have good, effective strategies about how to intervene that don't take a really long time for them to do and follow a, a very detailed procedure. You certainly need procedures, especially for documentation. But we need to create time in our professional development for teachers to practice these activities. So that way they don't contribute to this disconnect that we see between students. So I was saying some of our research shows that when we ask students about this issue, 43% say that they've seen adults watching bullying and doing nothing. 58% think that the adults are not doing enough to prevent bullying in their school. And 61% of kids thought that the adults only made the situation of bullying worse. And this is from a very large study of over 15,000 students. But when we turn around and ask the staff and the teachers and administrators in those buildings what was going on from the adult perspective, we saw that 97% of the staff thought that they would intervene if they saw bullying. 87% thought that they handled it pretty well. And only 7% thought that they made it worse. What contributes to this disconnect between what we're seeing in students and adults? Well, I turned to this drawing that was uh, provided to me by one of my colleagues, Sue Swearer, in a program that she uses quite a lot where you actually ask kids as part of a conversation about bullying, what bullying looks like, is that she asked kids to draw a picture of a bully. And this is a real life kid's picture drawing. And you can see on the left hand side, there's a kid with a halo at the top. And it says, this is what bullies look like when adults are around. But on the right side, 
you see with the devil horns. This is the bully when adults aren't around. And that really highlights for us how kids can look like they're really good and angels to us adults, but we don't really understand the kid perspective. In fact, some research indicates that kids that are popular might be more likely to be involved in bullying and that they use their bullying behavior to ensure their higher status in the school and their popularity. So we need to make sure we don't bring with us into these situations bias of assuming that this kid's really good because they do well on tests or that they're great athletes, that they must be uh, not involved in bullying because, in fact, those dynamics can change pretty quickly. When we think about intervention, we often encourage administrators to think about bullying from a tiered perspective where you're thinking about what are you doing at the individual level that's making programs and support services available for kids who bully and those who are targeted by bullying. What are we doing to talk with parents of kids that are directly involved in bullying situations? At the classroom level, we want to think about how we bring in our school-wide rules, reinforce those, and practice those in the classroom setting. One way to really make this issue important and relevant for kids is to hold classroom meetings or conversations with them. Lindsay will talk a little bit about some tools and materials that have been developed through the OVAS program that provide a structure for those classroom meetings that help kids learn to be empathic and supportive of each other, relate to kids that are involved in bullying. We need to definitely provide direct instruction for students about how to respond and then provide those basic foundational skills around emotion regulation and conflict resolution that will help kids navigate complex social situations and know when to go to adults and parents when they have problems. And parents need to be armed with strategies that they can use when their kids come to them. Classroom management, I think, is really one of the best defenses in this area. As I started off talking about the role of adult supervision, clear expectations and good classroom and school climate, classroom management is critical to that success. And on the school level, we often encourage schools to collect data on bullying. And that could take the form of anonymous surveys that students and staff fill out where they report about bullying. Sometimes making them anonymous is a little bit easier for us to administer and also helps kids feel a little bit safer reporting on it. Other schools might do a drop box where they have information, like a little ticket the kids will fill out, drop in, in the counselor's office to report on incidents of bullying if they don't feel comfortable coming forward directly. That could be another source of data on this, as could office discipline referrals or suspensions. But we know there's so much bullying that happens that goes unreported. That's why using those surveys can be very, very informative. Having a coordinated team that talks about issues of bullying in relation to school climate is helpful. and That team can help provide training and leadership and supervision about where bullying happens in the school and try to stop it before it starts. Having school rules that are specific related to bullying and positive behavioral expectations are also a critical element of this, as are having those consequences for student behavior and having a continuum of consequences that include positive behavior support up to more serious consequences for repeat offenders. Involving parents at all steps in the process is essential. Other recommended strategies, especially when you're talking about a kid being involved in bullying as the target, what do you do? What do you say to them? You want to directly label for them that bullying is wrong. They don't deserve to be treated this way, even if they dress a little bit differently or they carry themselves a little differently or they don't fit in with the group. There's nothing that they've done that makes them deserve to be treated that way. Directly state that it's not okay to hit back or to go have some form of retaliation. You also want to make sure you listen. We're already always disheartened when we look at the data on this and find that a number of kids that experienced bullying felt that the adults didn't really listen to them and nobody really heard their concerns. We also want to think about different strategies that kids can use. Sometimes they can turn to their peers for help or even avoid situations where bullying happens. What we don't want to do is shift the burden of responsibility onto the victim to prepare themselves and protect themselves. But yet we can give them a set of coping strategies. While adults are working on trying to prevent this problem, we can also help kids better navigate these situations. 
Other recommended strategies are about open communication, both with kids as well as with school staff about the issue of bullying and how serious it is. Encourage parents to really reach out to the school when they need help, and such as the guidance counselor is one area where we found in our research that the counselors feel that parents feel most comfortable going to. And in fact, sometimes mental health services are going to be needed, either through the school or through community-based supports. Develop a process for that homeschool connection, maybe a behavioral matrix for kids that are involved in bullying and other kinds of behavior problems, so that way parents can be part of the solution. Rewarding positive behavior and non-aggressive responses is critical, and limit exposure to violent media or content. The positive behavior support framework, also referred to as positive behavioral interventions and support, is a model that's used in about 20,000 schools across the United States with great success when implemented with fidelity. We've been able to see that having a set of strategies based on basic behavioral management, supervision, and organizational leadership, that schools are able to teach kids a set of behavioral expectations, like being ready, responsible, and respectful, and that those can be easily mapped on to preventing bullying behavior. We also want to recognize good behavior when we see it in kids. So having a reinforcement system, it might take the form of a ticket, or some other kind of token that kids can even exchange in for pencils or other kinds of school supplies. What we're not doing is providing kids with you know, computers and bicycles and things like that just for acting good at school. What we want to do is eventually have them internalize those expectations so that way they know what it looks like to be good at school and to be ready and responsible and respectful to their peers. But these kinds of systems also serve as a good reminder for the adults to have a positive interaction with kids that they're seeing. In fact, much of the positive behavior support framework is really just about changing the way adults interact with kids. And thus, it's critical that we have staff buy-in for these kinds of initiatives. In the positive behavior support framework, there's a team-based approach where school staff work together with the administration using data to inform decisions about where and how they can intervene at school. This model of positive behavior support can be implemented in any school type. I know most all of you are working in elementary school settings, but it could also be used in alternative settings, special school settings, even all the way through high school, other kinds of non-traditional settings. It can be used school-wide and really should be used school-wide and not just in a particular classroom or with a subset of students. And it doesn't come in a shrink wrap box where you buy it and put it on the shelf in, in many cases, but rather it's more about a process and a philosophy about how you run your school. And another thing that's critical to the successful implementation of positive behavior support is having a coach that works with the team, really rolls up their sleeves, and helps the school implement this. And it follows this tiered type of model, much like we've been talking about. Like there's strategies that can be used school-wide as right is represented here on this triangle, those green zone strategies, like good instruction about how to respond to bullying when you see it, who to go to, what to say to kids that bully, or what to say to kids that might be targeted by bullying. And then there are kids that are involved in it more directly that might need some more targeted kind of interventions. We think of those as the yellow zone types of supports. This is really for those at-risk kids, the fence sitters in many frames. Then there are the kids that are pretty heavily involved in bullying or other kinds of problem behaviors. They're going to need more intensive types of support. And models such as positive behavior support are multi-tiered and provide this framework about what to use at these different levels. Other strategies around stopping bullying when it happens is you want to have that immediate response, really intervening, and thinking about from this tiered perspective, are there supports that I could provide most immediately in the context in which it's occurring for the kids that are involved in bullying? Sometimes this means telling adults it's okay to get help from others, whether it's help from a principal or a guidance counselor or another teacher. That's often very critical in, in helping to motivate an effective response separating the kids, ensuring safety is critical. Sometimes that might even mean getting medical or mental health supports for the students, staying calm and relaxed in these situations and not getting overly worked up or anxious uh, is something that some staff need practice, learning how to reassure themselves and reassure the kids that are involved in bullying. So that's why we recommend in professional development sessions you actually do some role play where the adults can learn 
how to intervene effectively, and that they can model respectful behavior when they are intervening. Some common mistakes or pitfalls that we see that staff engage in are sometimes ignoring it, thinking it's just going to go away or kids can work it out on their own without adult help. The problem there is sometimes they can't work it out on their own. And by ignoring it, that somewhat signals to the kids that are involved in bullying that this is OK and it's going to be tolerated in the school environment. Don't immediately try to get to the bottom of the situation. Pulling out all the details and the facts, that can be done a little bit later. What we do want to do is reinforce that the kids are heard, they're respected, and that the behavior is not going to be tolerated. It's not going to be accepted. Don't force other kids to say or report out on their friends, because they may not feel comfortable doing that, especially in front of other youth. Don't ask questions in front of other kids, especially among the ones that are the target. They're not going to feel comfortable disclosing that. Separation, that's really one of these key themes across this, handling this. And this is where the time investment comes in, talking separately with kids. And making sure that you don't force an apology. Sometimes that can just seem very fake to kids or that they feel uncomfortable doing so. So I really don't, and the literature generally suggests that we don't want kids to just shake hands and get through this or have an apology right then or there. Occasionally, we do need to have medical attention or police involvement. And that's especially when there's a weapon involved or you have concerns about racism, that it might be more of a case of harassment rather than traditional bullying. If there's any kind of injury, you really want to make sure that that's well documented, especially if it's of a sexual nature. Other not recommended strategies, kind of moving from the individual event itself to what people might be doing school-wide and thinking that they're, they're putting in place a solution rather than a, an effective response. Sometimes we hear parents saying that they're going to, of the victim, reaching out to the parent of a perpetrator or kid that's bullying. And while this might seem like a good idea, the parents could just kind of work it out among themselves, what happens nine times out of 10 that we get into a he said, she said kind of situation where the parent of the target starts blaming the parent of, of the kid that's bullying. And parents sometimes get really involved in this and such that they do and say things that are inappropriate or model inappropriate behavior for their kids. and Sometimes coach their kids to hit back or even make the situation worse. So this is why we really want the schools to be part of those conversations rather than bringing the parents together directly. Obviously, in any situation of problem behavior, we don't want to advocate for corporal or physical punishment by kids, because in many ways, that continues to model aggressive responses. Grouping kids who bully together, this might sound a little bit funny, but sometimes schools will start putting together kids that have problem behaviors into a group. But we've actually known through the literature that that only can actually reinforce their behavior. They actually learn how to bully better and try to one-up each other in those settings. So you don't want to group your kids that are bullying together, and we're generally kids that are aggressive, unless you have a really clear structure and great supervision about how you're going to manage that. Generally, we recommend that the groups be a little bit more mixed and that you try to model some positive behavior. Zero tolerance strategies. Sometimes schools just have an automatic suspension or think that it's a good strategy to have a zero tolerance approach. But what we really want schools to do is think about a continuum of positive behavior support. So that way we can escalate our response that's appropriate for the kid's behavior, rather than saying they're automatically suspended. Because what happens in that situation? The kid goes home. Sometimes that's actually reinforcing. In many cases, they don't want to be at school in the first place. And sending them home actually only increases the likelihood of them engaging in that behavior again. And what happens when they go home? Sometimes the parent may not have a good, effect, an, an, a good strategy for helping the kid learn other ways to interact with their peers. And generally, when they're suspended, they're not getting any kind of intervention or support. Conflict resolution or peer mediation strategies are widely used in schools. But we don't recommend them for use in bullying situations. The reason why is they typically bring the target and the perpetrator together face to face. And someone asks them to just shake hands and work this out like it were a conflict. But bullying is different. It's a case of abuse, and it needs to be handled differently than we would other kind of fights that would occur in a school setting. 
this last one is probably, uh, these last few ones are probably a little surprising to you. We've heard a lot in the media about the potential link between bullying and suicide. And some schools think that that's a good idea to pass along to their students, talking about suicide as a possible outcome of bullying. But what we know from the research on suicide is that sometimes it can lead to a copycat effect. When kids engage in suicidal behavior, other kids hear about it, and it somewhat sets the tone that that's OK or that's an appropriate way to handle depression or anxiety. So generally, we don't want to talk about suicide, even if it's a bullying-related suicide in school settings, because that can sometimes glorify the act. So generally, we don't recommend linking for kids the idea that bullying can lead to suicide. And in fact, the research has been very mixed on this. Most bullying situations really don't lead to suicidal outcomes. However, there are kids that have a history of mental health problems that can be particularly vulnerable. And in the right setting, the, the bullying can actually contribute to more serious thoughts of harm to self or others. And broadly speaking, there aren't any short-term solutions. Bringing in an acting troupe or hour-long presentation about bullying isn't going to be enough to actually change the behavior of the climate in the school. A more systematic approach is really needed in the school setting. And with that, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Dr. Lindsay O'Brennan, who's going to talk a little bit about what some of these strategies look like in the schools that she's been working with. One school has really, a, a number of schools, in fact, she's been working with, have adopted this positive behavior support framework as a way of trying to address bullying in their school setting. Lindsay, you want to chime in here? Yeah, so thank you, Catherine, for introducing the bullying research and some of the evidence-based strategies for bullying prevention that we can use in the schools. I'm going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes talking about specific programs that are being used in schools across the state of Maryland, um, and more specifically, ones that are being used in Baltimore City Public Schools. So as Catherine mentioned, we encourage schools to take a multi-tiered approach to bullying and youth violence prevention. For some of the schools, administrators and staff, they don't specifically state that bullying is a problem for them, but rather they're struggling with more disruptive climate and that sense of chaos school-wide, which is often why um, we start to encourage schools to implement a school-wide program, such as Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, or PBIS, as Catherine mentioned before. And this really helps to set the stage for bullying prevention. So as you can see on the, there's several images on the slide, um, and these are taken from one school in particular in Baltimore City that's using a PBIS framework. And for this school, they identified be respectful, be responsible, and be safe. You can see the Pimlico Stallions code of conduct there. Um, and the students are rewarded with stallion bucks. Um, they receive these stallion bucks when they display positive behaviors at the school. So as part of the PBIS framework, they have these rules posted throughout the building, including classrooms, hallways, bathrooms, as well as the cafeteria. Um, and while these rules aren't specific to bullying, they encourage pro-social behavior between students and staff, and they help create a positive school climate. You can go to the next slide, Catherine. So I want to spend the next couple slides talking about the Olveus Bullying Prevention Program. That name came up a little bit earlier in the talk. Um, and this is being implemented in Maryland schools as well as a number of other schools nationwide. The Olveus Program is a universal school-wide effort. And it involves adults and students in the school community. So it's not just teachers, but it also includes administrators, counselors, cafeteria staff, custodial staff, bus drivers and other members of the school community. So that includes parents as well. Uh, this program really focuses on the school as being a system and aspects of that system that support or discourage bullying. Um, it also is looking at individual behavior. So you have that dual focus of a system and individual intervention. The Olveus program aims to not only prevent bullying, but it also deals with bullying problems that arise. The main focus is changing the climate, those social norms that are embedded in a school, so that bullying isn't necessarily cool anymore, and uh, no children are marginalized or being left on the outside, on the outskirts of things. And lastly, and really the most important thing I want to highlight about this program, as well as any of the school-wide programs that I mention, um, it doesn't have an end date. So ideally, these practices will be woven into the fabric of the school. 
that they'll be integrated into the climate and it's not a short-term intervention. You can go to the next slide. So you'll see this puzzle image on the right of the slide. and It shows the four different components of the Olvaeus program. So one of them is school-wide policies and practices. Second is classroom discussions. The third, individual interventions. Um, and then this last part here is um, the integration of parents and community involvement. And these pieces need to fit together like a puzzle because every adult has an important role in making the effort for bullying prevention to work. So I want to talk specifically right now about school-wide components and practices as part of the Olvaeus program. So the first, um, the program suggests establishing a bullying prevention coordinating committee. And this should include staff across the school community. So that would be teachers, special education staff, mental health staff, administrators, paraeducators. The second is that committee will help develop some school policies on bullying and introduce school-wide rules. As part of the Olvaeus program, schools want to explicitly address bullying behavior in their rules. So for example, rules could be, we will not bully others. We will try to help students who are bullied. We will try to include students who are left out. And if we know that someone's being bullied, we will tell an adult at school and an adult at home. So again, each of those rules specifically addresses bullying behavior. The last part here is that schools want to start collecting data on bullying at their school so they can identify hotspots for, for peer victimization. Uh, we often find that these hotspots happen in the hallways, the bathrooms, or the playground. And the state is really going to help schools and administrators identify areas needing additional adult supervision and follow-up support. You can go to the next slide. Another component of the Olvaeus program is um, specific to the classroom. So Olvaeus suggests using weekly class meetings to increase student and staff conversations about bullying. Um, some of the topics include communication with adults and peers, identifying feelings, building positive classroom environments, and creating positive peer relationships. And those two images on the slide there are um, two of the workbooks that Olvaeus provides. And these are scripted lessons, so teachers don't have to worry about coming up with the content of how are they going to address bullying with their students. And this can be something that's, again, woven into the culture of the classroom, that weekly, on Wednesday mornings, this is what they spend time talking about. It also should be noted that Olvaeus isn't a classroom management program, but it really does provide teachers with specific strategies of how to pre prevent aggressive and disruptive behavior. So ideally, it will help ease some of those classroom issues. You can go to the next slide. This last part here, the last component that I'm going to highlight, is focused on individual level intervention. That first thing there, uh, bullet there, is close supervision of students' activity is key, as you all know. It's important for schools to identify students who are most vulnerable, to support and protect them, especially in our hotspot areas. So again, that could be our hallways, the bathrooms. There's also a need to identify students who are most likely to bully, so schools can stop and redirect their behavior on the spot. It's also important to note the role of bystanders. We want to motivate the majority of our student bystanders to also help their class rate, classmates. And again, reduce, um, change those behavioral norms. As part of the Olvaeus program, all staff receive training for on-the-spot interventions to handle bullying. And Catherine mentioned some of these strategies earlier. I've found that when I've been working with schools, this is a really powerful tool for school staff because it provides them with a model for what to do when a bullying situation is witnessed. As part of the Olvaeus program, there are multiple videos that staff can watch in their staff meetings. Um, there's an instance on how to intervene with a student on the spot in the hallway, as well as how to follow up with a parent, as well as how to talk to the teachers. And as Catherine mentioned earlier, the staff may be a bit hesitant to intervene in bullying situations because they're unsure of the best strategy to use in the moment. So I find that this provides them with a working script that they can use. The last one there, for those students who are involved in bullying as either a victim or a bully, teachers are going to be encouraged to hold meetings with the students involved and their family members. And during those meetings, intervention plans can be created to ensure that the next steps are taken. You can 
go to the next slide. This one I really want to touch on. Um, kind of as we wrap up, I want to highlight some lessons my team and I have learned when addressing bullying prevention, and more generally speaking, just implementing school-based programs. First, if you're working with an outside consultant on bullying prevention, it's really key that they take the time to build rapport with you and your staff and administration. And this can't be done in just one or two brief meetings at a school. Um, it really takes time, and it takes repeated visits to the school at different points in the school year. I think we all know that at the beginning of the school year, things might have, our, have our, the honeymoon period. But then as testing comes underway in the springtime, students' disruptive behavior may change quite a bit. And I think when you build that report, it really helps the consultant best understand your specific needs as a school. Another point, as you all know, is that the principal and administrator leadership is key. And ideally, we want the administration to attend all the school-wide bullying prevention meetings and really help create those bullying school-wide rules and help problem solve with teachers. Another critical element is focusing on building up the foundation for a positive school climate. This has really been emphasized throughout this presentation. Um, oftentimes, I find many of the schools that are interested in the targeted interventions right away. They want to address those mo the most severe problems. And while I recognize that that's very important, um, I suggest to schools that they make sure the basics are in place before they do any type of targeted intervention. So making sure the school-wide rules are posted throughout the building, making sure there's a clear office discipline referral system, and if there's a positive reinforcement system in place. This will help any type of bullying prevention program. I also try to meet schools where they are, so using a strength-based approach and building off strategies the schools are already doing well. So for instance, if a school has a strong mental health team, I often encourage these individuals to participate in the school-wide team meetings as they can help develop interventions for our students involved in bullying. And lastly, I always refer to the schools as the expert of their students. While I might have the training on the evidence-based practices and bullying prevention research, it's really essential to acknowledge that the administrators and the teachers know their school far better than I ever will. They know how students function on a daily basis, and they know what kind of support they need from me as a consultant. You can go to the next slide. Kind of with that, um, I can open it back up to you, Catherine, on kind of taking that multi-tiered approach. Yeah, and the point of this slide of revisiting it is just to encourage all of you to think about what you might be doing school-wide or for targeted groups of students around bullying. And one thing that is sometimes a little tempting is that schools think, oh, i got to do more and more and more and just adding on more programs doesn't necessarily meet the students' needs. So we often ask schools to review in, in kind of an inventory fashion what programs do they currently have? And so you can even take this as a bit of a template and list out what kind of strategies are you using school-wide for all of our students around bullying prevention? Is there a curriculum or lessons or an event that all students go to? What's happening for targeted groups of kids that are at risk for being involved in bullying? And list those out. Are you using a mentoring program? Is there a counseling group or other kinds of skill development that's occurring? Or what's happening at that more intensive level? What are the supports that you use for kids that are directly involved in bullying? And you can use this not only with bullying, but more broadly with other kind of problem behaviors. It might serve as a bit of a starting point in your conversation with your school staff about resources and supports that are existing within your school, or might need to be tightened up and made more broadly available. I did also want to talk a little bit about some potential resources and suggested readings that you might find helpful to share with the, your school staff. This here is a list of a couple of books. These are ones I've read all of these, and there are a dozen more that I could recommend. But I think these are nice starting points for the conversation. This first one, although it's a little bit older, it was written by that guy, Dan Olveas, we were talking about. And it's actually a very quick read. You can pick it up and even just in an hour or two get a pretty good handle on the research around bullying and the basic elements of bullying prevention, both for teachers and educators as well as for parents. So it's a really nice, efficient read. There are other broader packages, such as the Obey's Bullying Prevention Program, 
if you wanted to think about how to implement that in your school, this is a good resource. In fact, in order to fully implement the model, you need to hook up with a certified trainer. Both Lindsay and I have been through the Olveus training. And while it isn't a model that's for, perfect for every school, and there are a lot of challenges with that model, particularly about having all the buy-in and being able to implement all the strategies school-wide, but there are a lot of really great things about the model. So I'd encourage you to do a little bit more research on it and see if it might be a fit for you. Other, the rest of these here, a little bit heavier on the research. It might have a chapter on different topics like impacts of bullying or different strategies. So if you really want to drill down into the research, the uh, remaining three are, are good resources on that. And if you just want to get some information online, there are a number of free resources that are readily available to you. I think by far the best resource is the StopBullying.gov website. This is where all the federal agencies came together and said, let's put one resource out there. And there are materials for parents, kids, and educators. I even did a brief video on some of the topics we talked about here today about what not to do around bullying prevention that are available for download there. You can even download a whole PowerPoint presentation with the annotated details on it if you wanted to do a more complete training for your staff about bullying prevention. Lindsay is a school psychologist and is familiar with this next resource that's put out by NAS, the National Association of School Psychologists. And they have an online resource kit that can be really helpful for a broad range of topics, including bullying. There's also information that's available on the CASA website, which is a collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning, as well as the National Positive Behavior Support website, www.pbis.org. If you're interested in other programs around bullying prevention or violence prevention or even substance abuse, the Blueprints for Violent Prevention website is a good resource, as is the one put together by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This really concludes our first session. We're going to be together in just a few weeks where we're going to talk a little bit more about the issues of bullying prevention, particularly from the perspective of the system type of framework, the positive behavior support framework. So on February 25th, we'll be back together to pick up on this important theme around bullying prevention, but really talk more about a systems-wide approach for addressing bullying and school climate in your schools. So with that, I pass it back to Honor and any closing comments she might have for the group. Well, thank you so much, um, Catherine, Lindsay, um, just a wealth of information. I hope all of you uh, got a lot out of it. I, I know I did. Um, this session has been recorded, and so uh, please join us again on February 25th when they, um, our experts come back and help us more. Thank you again, both of you, for your uh, time and uh, devotion. We'll see you on the 25th. Sounds great. Thank you again for including us in the session.